So I'm going to do something just a little different to start today. I'm going to play a video. And the video is about seven to eight minutes long, but I thought it was a great way for you to hear the scripture that I'm going to preach on. The video is from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 9. And I want you to pay attention in the video that, well, as it plays, who is really blind in this passage? Because that's what I'm going to talk about in part. So if you could please pr play that. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is they, he must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. And no one can work. <laughs> While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. Uh. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes. Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means scent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back, seeing. His neighbors then, and the people who had seen him begging before this, asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? He's the one. No, he isn't. He just looks like him. I am the man. How is it that you can now see? The man called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went. And as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? I don't know. Then they took to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. The day that Jesus made the mud and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. Pharisees then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He put some mud on my eyes. I washed my face, and now I can see. A man who did this cannot be from God, for he does not obey the Sabbath law. How could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was division among them. You say he cured you of your blindness. Well, what do you say about him? He is a prophet. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents. Is this your son? 
You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? We know that he is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But we don't know how it is that he is now able to see, nor do we know who cured him of his blindness. Ask him. He is old enough, and he can answer for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, who had already agreed that anyone who said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is old enough, ask him. A second time, they called back the man who had been born blind. Promise before God that you will tell the truth. We know that this man who cured you is a sinner. I do not know if he is a sinner or not. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. What did he do to you? How did he cure you of your blindness? I have already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciples. They insulted him and said, You are that fellow's disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we do not even know where he comes from. What a strange thing that is. You do not know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, nobody has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do a thing. You were born and brought up in sin. And you are trying to teach us. And they expelled him from the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me who he is, sir, so that I can believe in him. You have already seen him. And he is the one who is talking with you now. I believe, Lord. And he knelt down before Jesus. I came to this world to judge, so that the blind should see and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we are blind too. If you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. That's a powerful passage. I know it took a little bit longer, but I think it's really important that you see it all in context because I want to talk a little bit about uh, blindness this morning. If you could see one thing in your life today, what would it be? I know for some people, they're desperate to see Toronto make it past the first round of the playoffs. It's pretty petty in the larger scheme of things. I know I would love to live long enough to see my great grandchildren. That's something I'd love to see. I'd love to see the problem of homelessness addressed here in Sarnia, where it's an epidemic. What would you love to see if you could see one thing in your life? For some of you, maybe you'd love to see the great pyramids of Egypt or a cure for cancer or maybe something simple like healing in a relationship. People who are familiar with the struggle to end slavery in the United States know who Harriet Tubman was. Tubman became what known as one of the most fearless, courageous leaders in the abolitionist movement. During her lifetime, do you know what she wanted to see? She wanted to see her people set free. And she dedicated most of her adult life to that cause. Tubman's story, when you look into it, was it's absolutely incredible. She grew up the fifth of nine children. She lived a very hard life.
from the age of six, she was six years old, she was hired out frequently to slave masters where she endured years of inhumane treatment, almost dying at one point from a blow to her head. After escaping uh, slavery, however, Tubman went on a crusade for emancipation. And through a series of rescue missions, she freed hundreds and hundreds of slaves through a series of secret routes and safe houses that we know as the Underground Railway. Tubman lived into her 90s and she had the nickname Moses because she had freed so many people from slavery. And she claimed that ultimately her strength came from her faith in God as deliverer and protector of the weak. I was reintroduced to uh, Tubman uh, years ago when I had the privilege of visiting Atlanta. I went down to Freedom Way and Sweet Auburn. That's the historical district in which Martin Luther King had lived. And when I, was, when I visited that, I was really, really moved by that, that whole story and that whole area. Walking those streets where the civil rights movement began, I thought to myself, this is the soil out of which a revolution grew. And I walked the sidewalks that he walked and I looked in through Luther's, uh, Luther King's um, living room window and I stood on his veranda and for me it was just a profound experience. Great feet had walked these sidewalks, I thought. On the way around the area, a man offered to give us a tour. And as part of that walk, we came to an old fire station had, that had been converted into a bookstore. And when I got to the bookstore, there displayed on the racks, I saw a poster of Harriet Tubman. And I was gripped by the quote on the bottom. Here's what it said. I have freed thousands of slaves, she said, and I could have freed thousands more if they only knew they were slaves. Wow. Right? Such a powerful comment. Tubman believed that if people weren't aware of their true condition, in this case a situation of bondage and oppression, they would never be awakened to the possibility of freedom and a new life. So I just want to save that thought, and I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. The story we just watched together comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 9. It's the video where we see a man who's born blind, the story of a guy who gets his sight. It consisted, for this man, his life consisted of begging every single day, depending on the pity and charity of people around him for his moment-by-moment -moment needs. He's a man who lives in complete darkness. He has never seen the light. This man, Jesus tells us, is not responsible for his blindness. He was born blind, not because he did anything or his parents did anything. And people pass him by every day. He never needs to be reminded of his helplessness and dependence. He understands his situation in his life. He's not employed and never will be employed. He has no prospects of marriage. He has no social honor. He's at the bottom of the ladder. And over the years, he's learned to cope with darkness. Now, Jews at the time of Jesus who knew their scriptures, they knew that God commanded them to take care of the blind. Verses from the Old Testament called on God's people to have compassion on the blind. In the book of Deuteronomy, a curse was put on anyone who made the blind wander out of their way. And in the book of Leviticus, it says, do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your, Lord, fear your God, I am the Lord. Those who knew the scriptures also know that curing blindness was not a common thing. I don't know if you knew this, but there's no scripture in the Old Testament that records the healing of a man born blind. There were, however, passages that talked about the coming of someone and the coming of a day when some person specially sent by God would open the eyes of the blind and set people free. In chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah talked about the coming of someone who would be a light to guide the nations, open the eyes of the blind, free the captives from prison, and release those who sat in dark dungeons. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that Jesus began his ministry in Nazareth, and when he began that, he read from the scroll of Isaiah and quoted this great messianic passage that said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. It's not a coincidence. 
It's not a coincidence that healing people of blindness is the most recorded miracle that Jesus did. The story we just watched is actually filled with overtones from the book of Genesis. It's not just a healing, it's a story of recreation. You'll see that throughout the Gospel of John. He's constantly dipping back into Genesis. Genesis begins, in the, it begins with, in the beginning. The Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning. In this passage, what's happening is Jesus is beginning to do something radically new. It's a recreation. Imagine the scene behind it. You saw it uh, depicted in the video. Jesus bends down. He mixes a bit of spit with parched soil. He gets that in his fingers, and just like that redemptive act so many years ago, Jesus uses, uses the dust of the ground to create life. And he smears that gritty mixture on this blind man's eyes, and he tells him to go wash in the pool. Can you imagine even a fraction of the excitement that this guy must have felt when he had his sight restored? Somebody who's had his eyes shut all his life, suddenly, suddenly he's overwhelmed by the eruption of this endless cascade of color pouring into his eyes. The light had come and darkness had been broken in this man's life. I remember one time Caroline and I took our kids to the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. I don't know, if, raise your hand if you've ever been to the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. Yeah, a few of you. At a certain point when you get deep in the belly of that cave, they turn out the lights completely. And it's very weird. It's weird because the darkness is so overwhelming. You can't see anything. And it's almost palpable. You can almost feel the darkness. You know, I thought about this guy and I thought that must have been what life was like. He'd, you, he'd um, compensated by using all kinds of his other senses to get around. All through the Gospel of John, you're going to see a contrast between darkness and light. Even if you look at where the Pharisees were portrayed in this video, they're in darkness when the man comes in, lit only by a few candles. There's from the outside where it's well lit. John's constantly playing with that theme, talking about uh, light in the big, big, very beginning of the gospel. Um, John says this, the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. See the echoes of Genesis again? The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. In the chapter just before the blind man is cured, Jesus explicitly identifies himself as the light of the world. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have light that leads to life. The story of the healing of the blind man in this uh, passage is, is really brilliant. On one level, it's the, healing, uh, the record of a healing demonstrating Jesus' power, but on a deeper level, which is often the case with Jesus' stories, there's something much, much more profound going on there. It's not just the story of a physical healing. The last couple of weeks, um, we've been advertising uh, a class called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. There's a table actually in the lobby this morning if, that, um, if you'd like to sign up for it. I've done the class four times and every single time I've taken something new from it. I wish all of you at some point could take that class because one of the things that class helps us understand is that in order to better know God, you need to get to know yourself. This is something that great men and women all through the ages have said. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians, we need to come to know who we are in Christ, to put off our old self and grow into the new person that God has called us to become. The great church father, St. Augustine, once prayed, grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. St. Teresa of Avila claimed, almost all of the problems of our spiritual life stem from a lack of self-knowledge. The great a uh, preacher, Charles Spurgeon, encouraged ongoing, regular seasons of self-examination. And the reformer John Calvin wrote at the beginning of his most famous book, our wisdom consists of our entirely two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. If you want to get to know yourself better so that you can get to know God better, really encourage you to go to that table and consider taking it. It's really worth your time. Jesus, as the light of the world, wants to break into our darkness and help us see. But we can't do that if we claim that we're the kind of people that can see perfectly fine the way we are. 
That's the problem, isn't it, with the Pharisees. By willfully rejecting the light and insisting they can see perfectly fine, thank you, they remain, they remain in blindness and to come full circle. That's why I think when I was in Atlanta, Harriet Tubman's quote just kind of jumped off the rack at me. There's a clear sense that Tubman felt that she was offering people a road to freedom. But some people, either out of ignorance or complacency or rejection, they were fine to remain in their situation and didn't respond to the chance to be set free. One of the big realizations in this passage is that, the, is that we will all benefit deeply from better understanding ourselves, and that will help us better, understanding, better understand God. I want to share something with you in the passage that's really, really quite interesting. It's one of the fascinating parts of this passage itself is the way the man changes through the passage, the man who is healed. Um, with the change of scenes, the man who was born blind slowly and steadily gets to understand who God is better. If you look carefully as the chapter unfolds, you can see that growing and deepening. Let me show you what I mean as we go through the different stages. I want you to think about where you are along this continuum of devotion and trust. So throughout the story, Jesus gets identified more and more clearly. First, in chapter 9, verse 10, when the man is asked, who is this guy? He simply describes him as the man Jesus. Next, seven verses later, he's asked again, and he says he's a prophet. Chapter 9, verse 17. Further on in the chapter, as he's being in, um, in before the Pharisees in his inquisition, he says this man must be from God. And then finally, at the very end of the chapter, when Jesus comes up to him, he ends up saying that he believes and follows and devotes his life. He worships Jesus as Lord and Son of Man. So while the Pharisees try throughout the chapter to reject and discredit Jesus, as the story unfolds, Jesus' true identity is slowly being revealed. The section begins with the man on the side of the road. After he's healed, he's asked, who healed you? What happened? And the man's response, that man, Jesus healed me. Notice there, there's no great proclamation. There is no revelation of Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. There is no rush into exalted statements about Jesus as the divine son of God. Instead, he just says, that man healed me. And a little while later, the man is dragged before the Pharisees. And the religious elite have to figure this one out. In their mind, Jesus was an ordinary man and what they say, a sinner. Yet he opened the eyes of a blind man, something never heard of in the Old Testament. So the Pharisees asked him, who healed you? What do you think about him? And the blind man's response, trying to explain the work of Jesus, he says, I think, I think he must be a prophet. What's almost comical at this point is this poor uneducated beggar, as he grows in his understanding of who Jesus is, actually ends up trying to help these highly educated, religiously savvy people understand what they're supposed to be experts in, right? It's just so ironic. The Pharisees have no time for this petty dribble, though. They're infuriated. They adopt a condescending attitude toward the man. The basic problem for the Pharisees is this, that Jesus doesn't fit the mold. He clearly doesn't fit the mold. He's healing on a Sabbath. And they end up, as a result, they miss the whole point. They spent their whole life looking for the Messiah, and now he's right under their noses and passing by unnoticed because he just doesn't fit their preconceived ideas. Jesus has been saying things and doing things that they can't accept, so he's ruled out. He breaks Moses' laws, he hangs out with the wrong people, he doesn't recognize their authority. Instead, he dismisses traditions and threatens the world in which they live. We know that Jesus is a sinner, they continue, and they press for more. Surprised by their obsession with Jesus, the, the blind man says to them, look, I told you once, didn't you listen? Do you want to hear it again? Why? Do you want to become his disciples too? And that infuriates them. The thought of following Jesus was so revolting to that group of religious superstars that when this man goes on to suggest that he had been sent by God, he only succeeds in getting expelled from the synagogue, which was a big thing back then. Finally, the passage ends with Jesus approaching the man one more time, 
Note Jesus' tone is not condemnation, but possibility and hope. Do you believe in the Son of Man, Jesus says? Do you believe I was uniquely sent from God? And the man says, yes. And he falls down at Jesus' feet, worshiping him as Lord. Now, I want you to just think about the way the whole passage unfolds. For me, reading this chapter was kind of like when you get up early in the morning and the sun starts to rise and it just slowly fills the day with light. That's the kind of feeling you get from the passage. Or, you know, when you go in a building that's lit with those old uh, metal halide bulbs, you flip the switch and then gradually the lights warm up and it fills. Well, that's the feeling I kind of got from the passage. Jesus just gets brighter and brighter in chapter 9. And the scenes change, and he goes from Jesus the man to Jesus the prophet to Jesus the one sent by God, and finally to Jesus as Lord. Ultimately, here's what's interesting. That man didn't just need help. He needed God. He needed the Lord, the good shepherd, to take him spiritually from darkness to light. So as I wrap up, I want to think about what this means for us today. A few thoughts. John uses this story in, in the gospel to show us who Jesus is. So s- simple question, in these events, Jesus' identity is being revealed. How well do you really understand yourself and your situation? Would you recognize Jesus if he stopped along the way and offered you help? Do you understand your own needs? Do you even understand the ways you resist God's intervention in your life? Many of us never take that time for self-examination. But as you get to know who you are, the truth is you'll better understand God. Guaranteed. Here's how one writer put it. When we lack self-awareness, we misunderstand ourselves. And that leads to misunderstanding God as well. Our pride blinds us with inaccurate ideas about who we are in relationship with God. Our lack of self-awareness can also hinder our awareness of the hearts and lives of others and impact how we love and lead those around us. If we don't see and understand how we struggle to love God and others, we won't seek Christ to change the way we love. Second application point, ask yourself for a moment, where are you along this continuum of getting to know Jesus? Is he just a man to you? Or is he someone you call Lord? I want to encourage you. To think about that, the New Testament consistently pushes us in the direction of seeing Jesus as God's perfect answer answer to all of our deepest needs. Jesus was a man, but not just a man, and he was a prophet, but not just a prophet. And he was sent from God, but more than that, he reveals himself to those who have eyes to see as the, he reveals himself as the incarnate presence of God himself. And let me end with this, a final point. One of the things I take from this passage is I really think God wants us as Christians to be humble and teachable people and to be watchful of our own religious pride. In this passage, Jesus pits the simple trust of a man who was born blind against the theological arrogance of the religious religious establishment. The religious leaders of Jesus' day made it complicated, very complicated and difficult to find faith. Jesus saw people all around who were just burned out on legalism and religion. And he had an alternative that wasn't filled with endless requirements, but was based upon his love for them as children of God. Come to me, he said, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' language here and all through the Gospel of John and particularly in the passage we looked at, chapter 9, he always includes and invites people to take a next step towards him. While the religious leaders in this passage exclude and reject. Jesus heals and he forgives. The religious leaders strike out and they wound. Jesus had compassion and he welcomes the blind man in. The religious leaders reject the man and throw him out of the synagogue. Those who know their need in this passage are blessed, while those 
who reject Jesus claim they already have what they need. The broken receive healing through honesty and humility. The religious leaders remain trapped in a jail of their own making. The blind man receives grace and begins the process of change. The religious leaders remain, we're told, lost. So the blind end up seeing, and those who claim to see end up being blind. And that's the challenge, I think, for us, to be that kind of people represented by the kinds of words and actions of Jesus. That's the ongoing work for each one of us who want to become like the one who we follow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, if there are parts in our lives that suffer from partial or complete blindness, I pray that you'll help us see those. Father, as we get to know ourselves better, will you help us to, to better, understand, uh, better understand both our needs and our challenges, areas where we're willing to seek help and areas which we've shut off and uh, refuse even you admittance? And Father, as we think this morning about this passage, will you make us into the kind of people that are not theologically arrogant, but instead the kind of people that will help others take a next step towards Jesus along that continuum of faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.